Book Group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. Chapter 10, 12th of September, 2012. One Day, Queensland, Australia. Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our chapter 10 discussion of Through the Mists. The name of the chapter is an explanation, isn't it? Yeah, cool. How are you guys doing this week? Ooh, everyone take a big deep breath. <laughs> I'm not sure how to interpret that, <laughs> except that it's a big week maybe. <laughs> Uh, do you remember what, we, what I was talking about at the end of last week about humility? Do you remember what I was saying about what humility might really look like? Nope, nobody remembers. <laughs> Mustn't have been that impactful. Um, yeah, if we go to Deirdre, because she's got a mic. Um, that it doesn't have to be crying all the time. Sometimes it's just that, <laughs> that, that yucky feeling that you told me about. Yeah, yeah sometimes it's, it's just, just about allowing yourself to feel uncomfortable, to stretch your comfort zones and not resist that. Just be with the new experience. So, so is that what the <sighs> means? <laughs> Maybe, yep. Do you want to pass back to Glenda? And then you can go all the way back to Rochelle after that. Humility would also be open to allowing joy and pleasurable feelings too, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a willingness to experience everything. Yeah. yeah. But what makes you say that, Glenda? Oh, because I've been feeling crap. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to avoid and that. I would, oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So it would not be humble to now go and uh, try to generate some joy in your life. <laughs> no, no. It's just recognising that there is both sides to it. Yeah. Absolutely. And not to cut myself off from that if yeah. it happens. <laughs> if it when happens. it happens. Yeah. <laughs> but can you see how sometimes our questions are actually about helping us trying to avoid an aspect of what we're going through? Yeah. If you go back to Shell, you you done? Yep. Okay. If you pass back to Lizzie, it's interesting. We had a, a meeting, and um, uh, Max said he was feeling unsettled, and I said it's really good to be unsettled. And then I realised what I was saying because I don't feel really good being settled. You know? <laughs> yes. It's like it's being comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. I guess, and um, you know, I've said it, but at the moment I'm. Recently, I've been really uncomfortable and having to be okay with that and not try and go into a routine or go into something that I'm familiar with. Yeah. But it's really hard. It is. Mm. But it's a great thing to practice, Lizzie. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it is about... It's like stretching the comfort zone, hey? And being, like you said, becoming more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. We... We're kind of used to living in this very narrow frame of um, what's... Ex Renee just walked in front of the camera. Yeah. Just if you can be aware of it, because it helps lots of other people, so, yeah. Um, we're used to this really um, narrow f frame of reference in terms of what we're comfortable feeling, hey? We notice that when, um, when we go to the States and they have air conditioning, and, you know, they're very used to a certain level of air conditioning and if it goes up a bit, it's too hot. If it goes down a bit, it's too cold. And, that, and I feel like it's a real analogy for how we get emotionally. We go, I'm happy with this level of happiness anymore. That's too much. I can't cope. I'm happy with this level of discomfort anymore. I'm having a tanty, you know. And it's just, it's about like broadening that range because we don't understand that when we broaden it on the discomfort end and the pain end, we also are broadening it on the other side and so yeah that's a beautiful thing about it <laughs> Jennifer just curious um is that happening automatically <laughs> like yeah. as we're feeling more and working at being more comfortable with the uncomfortable stuff it's automatically in a, a lot of times, yes, mm -hmm. because what we're really um, doing is 
working through the resistances we have to emotions that make us feel uncomfortable. And as I said, sometimes joy makes us feel uncomfortable. So as we're working through our blocks to just having emotional experience, um, it usually broadens on both ends, but there can be specific things that block us towards really embracing desire or joy, uh, as it's just the same in the opposite direction. Thanks, that makes sense. Yeah, no worries. Okay, you want to talk about chapter 10? I should mention before we start, how's everyone going with their angry feelings with God? A lot of that came up last week. I know for you, Deb, there was a lot of that going on about feeling like this resistance to taking personal responsibility and wanting to rage at God about things. How's everyone feeling with that? <laughs> Christiana, you want to? I was getting through to the stage where I thought I had a pretty good relationship with God. I felt really comfortable and I felt God was there for me and, you know, I thought we were getting along just fine until I got deeper into an emotion and then all of a sudden I realised how much I was so angry with God about ignoring me and not listening to me and not giving me what I want and a yeah. whole range of things. And then I suddenly realised that, you know, Dad and Dad and, and Father God were sort of aligned again. And I went, oh, okay, this is how... And I don't really believe that you're there for me. And mm -hmm. it just exposed a whole new level of truth, which was really quite, um, you know, surprising. So yeah. it was like... Okay, more work to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's awesome that you saw that because I feel a lot of you get caught in that I'll just be angry with God and it's actually, as I pointed out last week, an addiction to avoiding the pain that happened in our life, really. We think I'll just be angry at God about it because then I don't have to acknowledge the pain of the real causes for those things which are often our parents or other people in our environment. So it's good that you made that magic link. <laughs> Okay, what do you guys think of chapter 10? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lily? If we pass to Sandra on this side. I was glad that he finally admitted he was overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it wasn't all just like, yeah, cruise, cruise, cruise. It was like, ah, at last, you know. Yeah, yep. Yep, yep, I agree. I agree. Does anyone want to volunteer to read the first paragraph of this chapter? Yep. So when you're reading, Sandra, remember that you're reading for the audience. So there's no need to rush. Just be with the words. Oh, is someone already there? Oh, okay. Yeah. If you pass oh, it to yep. Nina. Yeah. I have a vivid recollection of the fearful enjoyment and nervous bravery with which, as a child, I hunted for curios washed up by the incoming tide paddling with my naked feet in the fluctuating waters on the sea beach. I have no doubt but I, that, I, but that I accomplished a whole gamut of childish... Oh, God, I need my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I read it and then we can talk about it. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have a vivid recollection of the fearful enjoyment and nervous bravery with which, as a child, I hunted for curious... Wa washed up in the incoming tide, paddling with my naked feet in the fluctuating waters on the sea beach. I have no doubt but that I accomplished a whole gamut of childish heroics in my adventures, and I am sure there were interludes of surprisingly rapid recessions as my watchful eye caught sight of some advancing wave calculated to reach out its arms a few inches beyond its predecessor. Hope and fear, success and failure, pleasure and disappointment irregularly alternated in my experience until, drenched with spray and cold, my guardian carried me away from the scene of my exploits with scarcely sufficient treasure in my possession to convict me of petty larceny. What struck you about that paragraph, apart from my croaky voice, <laughs> when you read it? Uh, Karen, at the back. I loved it because um, 
I kind of felt vindicated because my life is a little bit... It, it, it said to me that, you know, um, his, that my attempt at understanding things intellectually is only going to end up in confusion, that you just sometimes got to jump around and it's, it, you're all over the place emotionally. Because what, what is he in, in that process? What is, what's his major emotion or his major attitude? I, th I think there's an openness to not, to not minding what comes next, a, a lack of needing to be in control, isn't it? Yeah, he's not in control and mm. he's fully engaged, isn't he, in what mm. he's doing? Yeah. What else is he? Someone else, if you pass forward to Raj. Uh, it really did things for me. I grew up by the seaside uh -huh. and um, in England. And <clears throat> so as a child, I experienced all that every day. Yep. Looking for things, on, well, washed up on the tide, and the joy and the and the, the fearful enjoyment and nervous bravery of of dodging waves and all that stuff, um, and it's so perfect because it, it is. I mean, the next paragraph goes on to explain, but it is so perfect for life, and it's. Uh, it just reminded me that we are just children here on Earth, and experiencing everything just as a child would, even when we get older. And we should stay with the fun of the adventure of the good and the bad. And yeah, well, yeah. he's demonstrating how exhilarating it was yeah. for him, wasn't he? And yeah. it, why should it ever change? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lolling? Um, when I read it, um, sadness to me um, because I could feel his exhilaration in discovery and his um, joy, joy and, and also anticipated fear and all of that that I vaguely remember as a child and then got swept away very quickly and I often say, what are my passions? What are my passions? And this is how you find your passions. And he wasn't thinking, I don't understand this. And what do I do next? He just went for it. And he didn't care about the meanings and that that I so often search for. And I just saw him. <laughs> desperately crave that, that innocence of just being like a child. Yeah, and, and obviously we're, given, we're being shown a metaphor, aren't we, for how we can live. And, and I understand your feeling, Lorleen, because, yeah, I think many of us share that, that kind of feeling about our innocence, yeah, that it's somehow lost. My question is, how do we regain this attitude to life? Do you all agree it sounds like a good way to live? Because what's he showing? What's he showing? What quality is he actually showing to us in that? If you pass back to Rochelle. Um, humility. Yes, like indeed. If... Just what we were just discussing. He's open to the fear and the joy and the disappointment and all of that. Yeah. 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 But how might we... How, given this, it's a very vivid and physical example, isn't it? So given that, does it give you any inspiration on how you might actually begin to live humility? It's actually telling you something about hum how humility might be. If you pass forward to Sandra, yeah. Um, from my own experience, I feel um, it's about actually doing what I want and stepping into the desires because that always now I realise is bringing up so much for me that I had no idea. I've been sitting cooped up like for months or probably more like almost two years and now I realise, wow, actually I'm learning so much more by embracing everything that, I, that is inside of me by engaging. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why do you think that is for Sandra? Why do you think she's learning more now that she's engaging desire? Pierre? Because... 
and she choosing not to stay and live in the fear, but she is choosing to face the fears and experience the fear, and she is opening to whatever happening. Yeah, the, I, I agree. She's yeah. whenever we take action, the f the fears that have held us in in action get challenged, but also because our hearts engaged in a desire. There's, there's more emotional engagement immediately, isn't there? And we have more opportunities to face ourselves and to make new, new choices when we take action. Can everyone see that? Yeah, yeah. So that is, that is actually a hallmark of humility, being willing to embrace every emotion, including desire. And I know many of you struggle with that, that feeling, but it's so rewarding as perhaps, Sandra, you're finding, but as certainly I have found, just by embracing desire, so much, so much is triggered, there's so much feedback every five minutes, but also it's very rewarding and you get to glimpse joy. Yeah. When we live in fear, it squashes all desire. So it's, it's finding this, you know, finding the place in yourself where you really want to know your desires and being willing to challenge them. That's when you can access joy. When you're without desire, you can feel that, can't you? When you don't have a desire, there's no joy, there's no spark in life. It's just like, pfft. when everything is duty or fear, and most duty is a result of fear, everything becomes very ho-hum, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, what else is Fred teaching us in this chapter? Christiana? Spontaneity. And there's really, there's probably an overall plan, but from moment to moment, breath by breath, things are changing, responding, and just going with the flow, just really responding and, and just being open and, and, you know, playful and, and in wonder and, yeah, it's yeah. just really sweet. So, and what does he tell us in the next part of this chapter? As Luli pointed out, he admits this is all very overwhelming, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what else does he tell us in that next part of the chapter? Anyone? Yep, if we go back to Shell. Um, what struck me was the same thing that you guys have been saying. No matter how much intellectual knowledge we have, when we hit with the truth or emotional, like it, it is that overwhelm and, and nothing he had learnt had really helped him emotionally. In, on one level. Yeah. yeah. Well, because had he, had he learnt about this stuff before? No, that's why it was overwhelming him. Was he learning in the process of being overwhelmed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. AJ said this great thing to me today. I said, oh, I've got to use that. He said, there's no such thing as me telling someone or anyone telling someone else something that they've never heard before and the person saying, I understand that. <laughs> why, do you understand what I mean by that? Why, why is that a truth? <laughs> Sarah? Um, it's great in this chapter how he talks about truth if it's not applied, it means nothing. Like any build this great imagery of if you just have all this truth in your world and you build and build and build and it's just going to crash down because it yep. doesn't mean anything unless you apply that truth, you feel it in your heart and you feel it. And exactly. So if I tell you, blur, here's a big truth about God and you go, yeah, I get that, totally. <laughs> it's not really going to be a truth that you're saying to me, is it? Because there has to be an emotional reception of truth in our souls, especially divine truth. We're always going to be engaged in a process. And that is a, that's another really beautiful thing that's pointed out in this chapter, isn't it? Yeah. So let's talk more about the point that you were bringing up, Sarah. Uh, what does he say about this idea that once we pass, we're going to have just total all knowledge? We're going to be. What does he? What does he feel about that actually? <laughs> if you go to Nina. Yeah. Um, how unrealistic that is and I think the overwhelming feel of this chapter for me was that it, it's, it's a process, our transformation is a process that requires patience, care and time yes. and highlighted for me how much I still push 
And there was a beautiful um, thing that, uh, be not deceived, God ever tempers the wind to the shorn lamb. He knows our frame and has ordained that our soul expansion shall proceed under conditions best suited to our state and which also tend to magnify his majesty and love. And I was just struck with the perfection of that and, yeah, just to look at my pushing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very beautiful, isn't it? What else do you see in that statement? What else did it bring up for other people? I agree with you, Nina, what you're saying. What else do you see, Sandra? Yeah. Um, I really, what struck me was that God's truth crushes into our obstacles within us and that creates turbulence within us and it's the turbulence that we need to give in to because that's the gift of God's truth, like confronting our error. Confronting error, yeah. And for me, it's been the opposite. I don't want the truth. I don't want to feel that discomfort that we've been talking about at the, front, at the beginning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Was that actually related to what you were asking? No. Probably not. So. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the specific passage that Nina read out because I would like to talk about that. Lizzie? Christiane, have you got um, For me, I actually underlined it because it was how gentle God is, mm-hmm. how um, everybody is so different and at different levels and God ever tempers the wind to the shorn lamb for me is how gentle mm-hmm. she is in... Um, Whether we're ready to receive more truth, that's when it will happen. Otherwise, you know, it won't. Yeah. 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 And to me, there's a real gentleness around that. Definitely. I agree. When you read it, it feels gentle, Mm. doesn't it? You Mm. think that's such a loving provision Mm. that God has, that that, um, he knows our frame and has ordained that our soul expansion shall proceed under conditions best suited to our state. However, it sounds lovely. But what do we observe around us? I observe, I don't observe you all wandering around going, this is so lovely what God's provided for me this week. I mean, these things are happening and I just feel he can see I'm ready and I'm going into it. (laughs) He's so gentle. So if we go to Glenda. (laughs) Um, On that thought, it's the third paragraph that... um I sort of resonated with what was happening with me at the moment. And it says, I have been told it was love, all love, and that I should presently be able to understand and appreciate it. But now I was like a lad thrown into the water, unable to swim. And later, a couple of pages later, he asks when Marie is unconscious, where's the love in this? Mm-hmm. And as the last few months, I've been finally honest and said, I don't really want to do this. Mm-hmm. And I'm feeling that war with, yes, I do, but no, I don't. And it seems that the law of attraction has really ramped up in that time and I'm not feeling the love in it. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, it re- well, there's a few things there, isn't there? Let's talk about, that's a bit further on, but there, the, the point I'm alluding to is the protest that many of you put up. It's too much, it's too soon, it's too fast, it's I can't deal with this. It's, so there is a lack of what quality within each of you. If you pass back to Ant. Humility. Yeah, and there's another quality. Um. <laughs> See, I, we'll come back to you, keep the mic because I know you want to say something. If we just overhear someone. I was going to say courage. Courage, no, yes, but another. Um, we don't have compassion for ourselves. Yeah, mm. yep. Luli? God reliance. And what is God reliance? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're just pulling things out without even no, thinking really about them. <laughs> what does it mean to be God reliant? What do you feel? Trusting God that God will give you what you can cope with. Yes. And so that's what Fred does and what I don't do. Yes. So there's this quality of trust, a trust in a loving God, actually, isn't there? There's, Fred displays this quality beautifully. He's, he, he never, the one thing he has learned, remember, before he entered the spirit world is that God is loving. So he just learned that one truth and look at how far it got him. <laughs> and many of you resist that truth. As I talked to Deb about last week, she's more happy to be angry with God than with her mum and her sister. And that, 
Can you see how that stunts so many things? There's a resistance to the truth of what's happened and it means you prefer to remain angry with God than accept that he's actually loving and other things that aren't loving are happening on the planet around you. One, one helps you grow infinitely and the other one just keeps you avoiding pain. Yeah. Um, but Anne just wanted to say something and then we'll come to you, Pierre. Yep. Yeah, um, I find that um, on this path, uh, I'll speak for myself, um, a lot of times you feel like you're not ready for what's happening. Mm -hmm. But the very fact, just reading that paragraph r reminded me that if it's happening, if my law of attraction has brought it to me, God believes I'm ready and has exactly. the faith in me to deal with it. And I find it's quite arrogant of me to think I'm not ready for this when God's telling me I am. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Because God wouldn't give me what I'm not ready for. And I want to stamp my foot and go, I'm not ready. I know better than you. <laughs> yeah, or it's, or it's too hard. I can't do this. Or poor me. Or, yeah. And God's going, no, you can do it. You yeah. can actually do it. Yeah. And if you do it, you're going to grow towards the potential I put in you. Not the potential you're trying to put into you. <laughs> the limits that we the have. The limits, yeah. And, and what I realised is it's just our fear that's, that we have that feeling. Totally, yeah. Yeah. So can you see, Glenda, in that, in that process that you're going through, there's a feeling that I feel that most of you still have yet to deal with, and that is, is God loving or is God not? And I feel like it's great that you get to a place and you go, well, I don't know if I want to do this, because that's honest. <laughs> and then if you get to the place where you go, I don't feel this is loving, that's also honest. The arrogance comes when we want to hold on to a point of view rather than being humble to the experience and letting, it, letting the emotions and the experience show us truth, because that's the way God's designed for us to receive his truth. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on that? Area, I'm coming to you, Pierre. You got this big thing where you, wherever you put up your hand, it's like, I want to say it now, Mary. I want to say it now, which is not humble. Got to sit with that feeling. We'll go to Lorleen. Um, it was about um, um, my my sense of control, mm -hmm. um, which is my own reliance, and what it made me realise when I was reading it was the. Um, that God is loving. And at one time I came to a realisation that I thought I knew about my life. I thought I knew about what happened to me. And, and I had a tendency to say, okay, this is what I want to feel. And... Um, well, this is what I should feel based yeah. on what I think happened. Yeah. yeah. And I sort of dictated where I should go and it didn't work. And so it was not very good, but this is what I controlled. And, um, and then I sort of let go of that and realised I actually didn't know anything about myself because there's particular errors and tendencies which I go in a certain way which cut out all the other things, which could be good. Yeah. But I just go in a certain way because I know all about myself. Yeah. And um, then I, I came to, to feel... The, the lovingness of how God was showing me uh, and it was gentle and so through all the self-punishment and things because I failed and etc I happened to come across uh, something I was talking to my spirit guide and I realized that um, having selected what I wanted to feel and then denying it because I couldn't feel it I allowed these spirits to control me and through this control I thought I was in control but I was totally out of control because they were controlling me yeah. and it was just this, this horrible word arrogance that I just, I know what happened to me and I know I need to feel certain things and yeah. certain directions and everything about me and, you know, it, it just sort of really hit me really hard that I don't know anything. And yeah. this passage brought it back of how, how loving God is in how if I let myself 
soften into what's happening around me. I am ready. And I will get I, through. Yes, yes, Lily. Now, you, now you're jumping over into just feeling some emotions when, when you didn't need to say any more. Yeah, you just need to feel them. Yeah. But you're right. One of the, the ironies of what happens when we try to control is that we end up being controlled in so many ways. <laughs> Because, we want, because fear is driving our desire for control, we, we are acting out of fear all of the time. We're trying to control everything that's happening around us. We open ourselves to spirits who want to help us in that endeavour, help us, but they actually end up creating long-term relationships with us and controlling our actions. And also because we're completely um, driven by the desire to avoid fear Anyone can come along and just threaten us with a fear and they can manipulate what we're going to end up doing. Can you see that? They, just ha they know I just have to make this person afraid and they'll do whatever I want. So we actually end up being very controlled when we avoid fear, which is what drives our desire for control. But the other really big thing that Lorleen was, and, and Ange was really, I've really been talking about is that God knows more about me than I do. And that's, a, that's the fact because we have had damage in our childhoods and we've come so far from, from what God created us to be. And even when we're born, we're not at the full potential that God put within us. And so it is an aspect of humility to recognise that God knows more about us than we actually know about ourselves. And when we engage that relationship with him, we're going to learn the most rapidly, not only about him, but about ourselves. Yeah. Okay, Pierre, you had your hand up before. Do you still remember? <laughs> yeah, the mic's there. I'm sorry if I was demanding. That's okay. Uh, I feel quite excited. And yes. So I'm just... Which oh. is, yeah. <laughs> the, it's that thing, do you, I don't know if you saw when I gave a talk in Kyabra last, and I talked about desire. And I talked about how sometimes when we hit a desire... We're so anxious that it won't happen that there becomes a demand added to the desire. So I love your desire, just not hot on the demand. Keep the desire. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like to come back to what you say all the time about we are angry at God. Yes. And also I feel I've been quite angry at God, like it's too hard and I don't like your laws. And, but I feel my major block is like I can believe intellectually he's more loving but I have this feeling that I am not loving I'm flawed and so what I would do more I would be angry at me and that has been my major mm -hmm. problem more than projecting at God yes um, punishing me and projecting at me and it um, doesn't lead anywhere uh, the same problem until I become self-responsible for but uh, that's, I want just to say that um, yes. many other people have this thing to be. Yes, and yeah. sometimes I watch you guys ping pong, and I have done, between yeah. the two, angry at God, angry at me, angry at God, angry at me. And both of the things are helping us avoid the truth. And the truth is what sets us free to feel and heal and release all of those things. So, yeah, yeah, good point you make, yeah. Okay. Back to, back to this idea of trusting God. At the, at the top of the third page in this chapter in this book, there's a passage. Does anyone want to read that bit? It's such a short chapter, we're allowed to really relax into it. <laughs> Jennifer. Although, when I told AJ all the things I wanted to cover with you today, he said, mm, you might need two weeks. <laughs> I said, it's too short, we can do it. Starting where, Mary? Um, if you start at the bottom of page one, two, three, knowledge can only be acquired. Knowledge can only be acquired as we have power to assimilate each successive phase of truth. It has no force, no life, no energy unless applied. And the man who tries to accumulate it without the correspondingly necessary strength to utilize the same, if successful, would only find he had gathered together and built an edifice which, for lack of support, 
would fall and crush him in its ruin. No, that's good. Uh, it, obviously, it goes on, and you've all you've all read it. But um, what what do you guys feel about that passage? It's what Sarah alluded to earlier. How does this apply to our life? It's really the question I always want to ask you. This thing, this knowledge that that um, Fred is gaining. If you pass all the way back to Geraldine, did you have your hand up? Yep. Um, I took this paragraph in general as being um, about taking the time to really um, feel and integrate any new um, realisation that we have. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me again of something that we talked about a few months ago, which was that we can tend to get excited and go and um, think that we know something because we've just made a new discovery and a new realisation. And then, for me, um, that's always a, a very dicey place to be because I can be very attracted to go and talking about it and then I don't integrate it. Yes. I, I find that it really seriously interrupts the process because I've gotten the approval that I wanted yes. or whatever It's else. actually an addiction that makes us want to go and share what we've just processed. You know, it, and it shows that we haven't fully surrendered to the process in the moment because when we're truly humble in that moment, it, it opens us up to God. We have that experience with God and we don't really even feel it feels. AJ said it to you guys, I know, and I really feel it now too. It sort of cheapens the experience. When I try and tell you and I think oh, it doesn't even sound like what I felt and I can't really get it across and, and it feels... Icky, and it's usually because of an addiction that I have that I want to even share it. Yeah, yeah. I agree, that's a good point from this paragraph. Any others? How does this apply? Nina, if you pass forward, Geraldine, thank you. It sort of follows on from Geraldine, and AJ's, you know, presented us with a lot of truth, and then we go, wow, this is really cool and off we go and, I don't know, like there's a tendency to shove it down other, pe other people's throat and it, it kind of shows that we've just really missed the point of the whole thing. Yes, yeah. yes. So when you... Oh yeah, if you pass back a few more. It also reminds me when you and AJ have pointed out to us that sometimes we put our hand up and say, I've got three questions. Number one is... Yes. <laughs> and then, oh, thanks. Number two... Yes. You think, Hang on, what about number one? Yes. You know, like, to really <laughs> absorb that. Exactly. Like, like I just said, there's no such thing as me giving you the answer and you going, yeah, I get that, I'll yeah. get the next one. Mm -hmm. Unless you're having some kind of emotional connection with it. Yeah, and it's cool also here. a reminder to me not to be too hard on myself. I'm not going to be perfect when I wake up in the morning just yeah. because I had a bit of cry tonight, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a growth period. Yes, that's a beautiful thing about this chapter. We can talk about more this lovely analogy of our growth, yeah. If you just pass back to Angela, she had her hand up as well. Yeah, um, some time ago, I suppose it was a couple of years ago, AJ actually said in a talk that he taught us enough truth that we could all be at one so my my big thing was we're obviously struggling struggling in the application of the truth yes because we're not at one yes exactly <laughs> exactly and what are the perils of such a such an endeavor when we listen 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 what does he tell us what happens what happens if we come oh yeah if we come back to sarah in the yeah uh, you're just building this uh, structure with no substance underneath it and it's just all going to fall apart because it's just... Yeah, and what does that mean in our real life? What's it going to mean if I come to every AJ lecture for four years and then I watch it all and, and I haven't even dealt with the fact that he's actually Jesus because I'm still calling him AJ and, you know, all of those things. What's going to happen? Just you're building up your arrogance and your facade and your intellectual knowledge and that's just even a worse place than you were before, probably, and probably forcing oh. that down people's throats <laughs> as well. Yep. And you just, yeah, it's all going to come crashing down too, maybe when you pass and you'll just realise the state you're actually in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll pass over and go, whoa, I don't get any of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
the lane. Um, I just listened to your mediumship this morning. Um, oh, yeah, I'm about to tell everyone about that in a bit. Yeah. Um, we spoke to Robert James Lees last night. Yeah, and, um, and I'm, it was a really great discussion, I, I felt, and it demonstrated ironic, or not ironically, of course, many of the points actually in this chapter and how much he had heard so many truths, but he didn't really understand the application of them. And I'm shy to tell you about the mediumship because I had this experience during it where he, AJ Jesus, asked him to clarify, <laughs> clarify the year of his death. And uh, Jesus said, was it 1941? And I felt, oh, there's something funny, 41, 42, something like that. Uh, that's what I conveyed. And just before the end of the channeling, Robert said to me, it's 31. It's, and I was so afraid of being a flaky medium because I thought it sounds flaky and it's probably wrong again. Oh, it's all flaky. I'll just leave it. And I, we finished the channeling. I got online and looked. He passed in 1931. But <laughs> that's my own lack of humility as a medium. But it was a very interesting channeling. What, which, what did you find about it, Lorleen? Just what you said, um, that he, he, he channeled these beautiful books and um, he came to the spirit world and then through his thinking he knew everything. He didn't seek for any help. And uh, yeah, it was just, yeah. just reflective of how... how um, dis uh, what's the word? Dece deceived we can make us... Yes, you know, like because he'd he'd been through all that time and he never really realised that there was an issue. I'll let you listen to it, but um, Jesus brings him around beautifully to the fact of what he's actually skipped over, and he he sees that he's skipped over quite a few things that he thought he knew, and that he was living. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer, you had your hand up. Did you want to? Oh, um, it was what we were talking about earlier. Um, just that I've been seeing very clearly in my life that I'm rushing to apply yeah. things that I'm not f fully, well, not just not understanding, but I, I'm not in a place of love when I'm applying them, and it's causing more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it, because that's, we've missed the, the primary point, which is about the love and, yeah, and that desire, yeah. Uh, Yvonne? Calling everyone by their real names from now on. So. Um, thanks, Mary. It, it took me back to the first paragraph and the analogy of walking along the beach. Mm -hmm. And it made me reflect on how selective I am for what I would notice, um, what appeals to me, yeah. where God's gifts are um, so many that everything, well... Like Ange was saying, everything there to be at one with God is in front of us. But I'm really being selective about, oh, I don't want this or I don't want that or I just want these ones. Like even collecting shells and this is the same. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been working on the, the outline for the humility study course and one of the, one of the weeks um, is all about avoidance. Actually, it's probably more than one week. But every time I avoid anything, there's a lack of humility within me. There's something I don't want to experience related to that person, that situation, that whatever it is. I would never actively avoid anything when I'm truly humble. It, it almost makes me feel like going back to the beach and walking along the beach and just seeing what I'm noticing and what would appeal to me and what wouldn't. Just yes, yeah. yeah. Something that you come to see as well is that fear actually drives so much of what we notice. And... That's why it's so important to work through fear because before we do, it's actually the radar we put out on everything and it, it actually directs what emphasis we give to different things, what we look over, what we see, all of, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so he's beginning to introduce this idea of um, needing to, to have time to assimilate truth, isn't he? And on the next page, he says something magic, which is probably a bit broad to ask you, what is the magic thing? 
<laughs> There's probably more than one. <laughs> Jennifer, you know it. Yes. What well, is it? It just stuck out that spiritual growth is slow. Yeah. And I know I get impatient, but I love the part about the unfolding of the flower. It's like you can't see it happening. Yes. But it is happening, and that's so beautiful. Yes, exactly. But is it fair to say that spiritual progress is slow? Is that what they're saying? I guess it would be more correct to say is, is often imperceptible. Uh, no, I don't Not agree. <laughs> I think we can perceive spiritual growth. So what is it, though, that, that, um, that's happening as the flower unfolds? What kind of change is it? If we come to Barbara, yeah. If we, oh, and if you just pass here. It's um, slowness and gradual are two different things. That's right. Mm. So what do we learn on this page about spiritual growth? Is it slow? No. It's, it's gradual. Okay, what else do we learn about it? We've already learned haven't we something about um, how would you summarize what we talked about earlier or about accepting what God gives to us so how 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 is the timing how does the timing work with spiritual growth perfect perfectly yes so it happens gradually but it's also um, timely timely that's a good word Okay, what else do we learn in this chapter? All these pages, sorry, about growth. Pierre? That we must start from where we are. So we must start by uh, acknowledging what we really are. Mm -hmm. So it requires no. acknowledgement. Of where we're at, yep. What else? Anyone? Sorry, I can't see. If you just pass it. If you go back to Amber at the back. Um, yeah, just on the top of, topic of growth. Um, yep. I feel it's really important. I've just gone... Into a bit of fear, sorry, Mary. Um, That's all right. Breathe. <laughs> um, it's really important because <laughs> you can't always physically see it changing. Um, and it's a feeling thing. Like with me, I can't look in the mirror, mirror and say, wow, you know, I processed last night and I look so much more physically beautiful today yeah. like the truth is I can't really see much change but um it's a feeling thing that you've got to acknowledge as well like it's not if you're sick for example you're not physically going to heal instantly you know it's like a it's like a gradual thing and it's not always something that you can physically see but underneath there's like a healing process <laughs> okay so what do you guys think about Amber's statement do you agree I agree with part of what you're saying, but not all of it. So if you pass forward to Sarah, yeah. Thank you, Amber. Um, I guess, like they say in the book, nothing is sudden. It's all inner effects which are working and working and working, and then you might be ignoring it for a long, long time, which creates a big outward effect, and that's when you observe it. But it's not sudden. It's not like it just happened. It's been going on. Again, I don't entirely agree with what you're saying, but there's part of what you're saying is true. If you pass back to Rochelle. Did you have your hand up, Lena? Um, I feel the truth is if you really are humble and you do open to God, you can have an instant healing. Like if you've had a headache or there's been times where I've had headaches and within 20 minutes it's gone. Yep. So I feel there's probably more resistance if you get really, really sick. And yep. maybe more blocks and things to get through before you get to the causal. But yep. I feel that there is 
The truth is we can instantly heal with God. So we can, we can see a big change in ourselves quickly if we're really humble. I agree with that. Yes. It's, it's, not, it's not instantaneous enlightenment though, is it? Because that's what he's talking about in this chapter. He's talking about suddenly knowing everything as well. That, is that ever going to happen? How many of you want that to happen? <laughs> How many of you have known people where that's happened? Where suddenly they had an enlightenment experience and now they know everything. Yeah. <laughs> You've never known that. <laughs> All right. I, I want to talk more about that in a minute. But someone had their hand up over here. Uh, yep, Graham. I feel it's a bit like the straw that broke the camel's back, that there's all this stuff happening in the background and then all of a sudden you get this last straw and then bang, something big happens. But it's not that straw that made the big effect. It's all of the other straws that came before it that you weren't even aware there was anything going on. Yeah. Sometimes it's like that, isn't it, when we, when we decide to be humble. Some, some of us need like a massive like, load upon us before we finally break. And some of us, the straw comes earlier, but it is, there is like a process where you suddenly submit to something. But there's something that, that Sarah alluded to here, and it says um, on page 125, he tells him... Um, so he talks about sudden changes are so in appearance only. Closer inspection will show they are all effects of causes which have been working silently and unperceived it may be and preparing developments which escape notice until forced upon our attention by some outward unfolding, which is exactly what Graham said. The next sentence. All expansion works from the inner to the outer life. Okay, can you see how that's significant to what we've just been talking about? And how we're looking, it's interesting that we've talked a lot about the outward experience, the outward appearance, because that's what we're all looking for. We want to see something change out here. And many people, when they hear divine truth, they try to change everything out here, forgetting that spiritual development happens from the inner life and it becomes manifest in the outer life. So this is a very important truth, I feel, for everything that we've talked about is changes can happen rapidly, but they'll always be gradual. Changes, outward changes can happen day to day, but they require a working on the inner life, and they're also not going to be sudden enlightenment experiences. So I think, can you agree that sudden enlightenment is impossible? Yes. yes. Why? Why? Well, that's my question. Why is it so attractive? Chris, yeah, yeah. We get to skip over a whole lot of pain. <laughs> so is, is that, this is my question, because I've written in my little margin, people these days addicted to abrupt changes and uh, enlightenment, immediate results. The weekend seminar rather than the lifetime growth is what people desire. And my question is why? We get to skip over pain. Is there other reasons why, Glenda? It's the investment in the facade. We always want to look good and be better without going through that hellhole. We don't want to be messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep your fast forward here. Yes, Chrissy. I feel it's giving up a lot of addictions. And what do you mean by that? Like, you feel enlightened and you feel really beautiful and you make it up, and, but it's not really true. Deep so it's actually live, it's, it's you, a you desire live a, to... To live a, a, wrong, a wrong life. From addictions, yeah. yeah. So okay. often people who present this facade of being yeah. very enlightened, they're actually... Yeah. Well, often what, is happen, what addiction is their dominant addiction? Deb, if you pass across. Uh, it's, uh, it's the spirits with them that are making them yes. enlightened. Yes, exactly. Mm. So that addiction is driving everything. Yeah. Okay, any other reasons why we're so... Nina? I think this concept of instant enlightenment, it's not that way. And in between... 
um, here and at one moment we're going to have to really put in the effort, you know, we're going to have to just get really sincere and just basically do the hard yards. There's no easy way out and I think we're all looking or hoping that there is an easy way out. And yeah. We can't go round it, we've got to go through it, you know. Yeah. That's exactly right, Nina. And I feel most people don't really understand the depth of what's required to achieve that, to achieve at one moment with God. Just like Ange said before that AJ's, Jesus has said, <laughs> Jesus has said that everything is, he's presented everything that we need to uh, achieve at one moment. He's presented it, but none of it's really entered in a lot of us because we don't understand this truth that there is a lot required in truly being humble in truth and honestly I think that's like that's fairly evident isn't it because there's not a hundred people already at one with God and there's a lot of like people out there engaged in all kinds of different endeavors but are they at one with God? No. So that shows there's going to be something required that's that's much deeper and more sincere than, than what we already see on the planet. Yeah. Uh, okay, if we just, if we go across to Pierre and uh, here to Christiana, and then if we just work back. Yeah. I think we have a big addiction to get anything given to us on the plateau. And yes. That's why, also why we like it. Yeah, so there's this feeling where we feel like we're entitled to have an easy life. And this is very dominant in the West in the West, um, you know, this feeling like oh, we should be able to be comfortable. This is why our comfort margin like narrows the, what, we, what we will allow in terms of discomfort and things it becomes very narrow because we're living in a way where we can control almost everything about our environment. A lot of other people in the world do not have that luxury. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Christiana, and if you keep passing back, there's... A a number of you over there. Um, recently, I was listening to a channeling that you did, I think it was in the US, with the fearful women. Mm -hmm. And there was a, um, a group of women who decided to do the experiment uh, that um, Jesus had set before them. And out of the whole of the group, there was one particular woman who allowed herself to really feel and drop down and be an emotional mess. Yeah. And uh, from that, she was actually able to grow and uh, was then removed and taken into the second sphere. And I thought, wow, was that a miracle? And I just wonder where miracles, because I have heard you say that at some stage, Jesus and yourself will perhaps be um, doing some miracles when God um, asks you to, when it's time. Yeah. And I just wonder, in this process of healing, where is this you know, the difference between the slow, perpetual growth to, mm -hmm. as opposed to the opportunities and possibilities of a, a miracle taking place and we do make a, a rapid change. Is the miracle part of the, like, you know, when a flower is wanting to bloom and it just holds back and holds back and the energy builds and a lot of things go on underneath and everything and then it's ready to, you know, burst forth? Or... Can you sort of... You've asked me like three questions. Sorry. Now, <laughs> That's Sorry. okay. Um, I think very few people recognise the level of assistance that is available to them in their spiritual growth. In the last chapter, I, th I think it was the last chapter, um, Kushner or um, someone with Fred points out that people don't realise that so much of what they achieve is through the assistance of other people. And that is not a bad thing. That's a great thing that there's so many people wanting to assist us. But I feel most people have this feeling that I've got to go it alone. I've got to, you know, I've got to make it on my own. It's that self-reliant thing that I've, I've got to get there. And I feel more and more that we don't realise just how much assistance is there from God and from our spirit friends if we sincerely ask, if we are sincerely humble. Um, and it can seem like a miracle what unfolds, what is actually just a natural event that would occur if we really opened our heart and asked for help. Yeah, yeah, that's my feeling. Hmm. If you pass back to Jennifer. 
lately I've been asking a lot of, from God um, for help, and it's coming, but it's really not what I was wanting. <laughs> And that's, that's that thing I wrote on the board earlier, remember? God knows better than us what it it's, is we need. It's really, really uncomfortable. But I can see, when I'm in a better state of mind, I can see the perfection of it. Yeah. Yeah. And th this is where, if you have this trust that God is a loving God... This is going to carry you through things where you feel like, the, just like Fred, this doesn't meet my expectations of what I think is loving. This isn't exactly how I thought it would go. But if you trust, if you can have that trust and be humble during the experience, a lot of new truth is revealed. Yeah. it's yeah. awesome. Okay. Who else had their hand up over this side? Deb? Uh, I just wanted to add to what Nina was saying that... Um, that the whole world's looking for a magic bullet. So yes. we're kind of going against the tide by... We've become spoiled, I guess, with pills, with medicine. Yeah, there's a lot of quick fixes, isn't there? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> oh, I always knew that was the root of all evil, Nina. <laughs> I always knew it was McDonald's. <laughs> I don't think we can blame McDonald's, sadly. Who else had their hand up over here? Alex, if we pass back to Alex. Yep. I was just going to say, um, we're so trained to be goal-oriented and, you know, through our work and, and everything else and the way we were brought up and yep. everything's deadlines and um, impatience and I've got to get this done by next Friday or, you know... Otherwise... What yeah. happens? Well, you'll be in trouble or... Yes. You know, yeah. And that's the part, but it's the fear part of... Or because is it bad to have a goal? Not at all. No. no. But it's... I agree the feeling that you're conveying is about how we, we start to equate our worth with what we achieve. Yeah. And the, the timeliness in which we achieve it and the success with which we do it, the worldly base worldly perception of success yeah yeah i remember saying to um, um helga and klaus when i started this path just just to feel my shame that i told them i would be in a state of oneness within a year yeah it's yeah. just <laughs> <it's> ridiculous <laughs> that's not ridiculous alex that's yeah. perfectly achievable I just felt that was my arrogance, though. So. Yeah. yeah. And it's also, it's also a sign of not knowing really what's involved no, yet, is it? No it's idea. like hearing a truth and going, yeah, yeah, I can do that, yeah. without going, whoa, okay, that's really a big deal, <laughs> what's, what's required. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Deirdre? And if we go across to Yvonne, who else has their hands up? Oh, yeah. Okay. I just know with my experience about why we want everything very quickly, like with my repentance exercise like I'll be crying for a week and I'm like god am I there yet you know and he's that my message was I have no concept yet of the pain I need to feel yeah to be repentant and I was like whoa but then the message was but we'll help yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was That's just good. like I cry for a week and I'm like I'm trying to like <laughs> That's big god I've never done that before <laughs> like yeah. to have no concept of yeah. the pain that I need yes. to feel, just yeah. for my repentance. Like, yeah. oh, that was blown me away. Yeah, yeah. That's good you've got good communication with your guides, did you? <laughs> um, yeah, since that exercise, it's like really um, established. I feel a lot more, a little bit more trust that God is loving, especially yeah. in this chapter. Yeah. Like the patience that God has for us. Yes. Like it's just, whoa. Yeah. And also, uh, lots of people don't recognise, but when you engage repentance, that is a really um, big way that you can open your heart to God. It's, it's a little known or little accepted fact, I think, but it's a, it is a big ticket to starting that relationship. Because it has started it with me. Like yeah. I can really start to get a, a concept. It's still not here yet, but... That God is loving. It's, it's now at least a, a concept I can visualise, yeah. if not feel yet. Awesome, awesome. Okay, if you pass across to Renee and someone had, the, yeah, Yvonne, while we pass it. On the spiritual growth, yes. Um, 
on the very last sentence of that, we're naturally unable to admit the reality of anything which lies beyond the scope of observation. And I felt, yes, I'm still... It, in other words, spiritual growth is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm, wanting, I'm wanting it to be observable so that others see that I'm growing mm -hmm. because I'm still seeking approval and all of those things. Yes. So we're still trying to enlist others in it. Otherwise, why would it matter? Exactly. That it was um, yeah. not observable. Yeah, mm. of, of course, when we're truly sincere about a desire for a relationship with God, it's going to matter to us a lot how, how we're doing in that and how, what is still in injury within us and all of those things. But it won't matter how other people perceive it as much. Yeah. We won't be doing it for them. A lot of people do things their whole life myself included, to get the approval of other people. That's, that's been the hallmark of my life. Um, and depending on the kind of people, depending on the kind of things I did. Uh, and it's very different to shift gears towards gaining approval from, you know, from God. There's a whole other different playing field, if you like, a whole other different moral compass. Yeah. It's a good shift to make. Yeah. Okay. Renee? Renee? Mm. Yeah, I'm struggling with that one a lot <laughs> at the moment. That shift. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask who, if there was anyone at one with God on the earth. On the earth, no. Okay. There's only ever been one. Which was? Jesus, Jesus. in the first century. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So, and since and then, it's been pretty rare to have anyone above the third sphere. Yeah, yeah. On Earth, obviously, in the spirit world, there's very millions and billions of people in that state. Yeah, yeah. So, as I said to someone that during the week, it's like we're turning the tide on a tide that's almost fully in tide the other way. We're trying to turn it around. So. There's a lot of resistance in the world around us just by people being themselves in avoidance of their stuff. That becomes a resistance that we face. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. Okay, let's keep going in this chapter. Yeah, so he says very beautiful things about our growth, doesn't he? Being gradual, but not necessarily slow. All right. Did anything else strike you guys? I want to move on to where he begins to, Fred begins to um, express his desire to return to the earth again and share with people. But is there anything before then, before we go to there, that anyone had any questions about or feelings about? Pierre? Yeah. Where's the mic on that side? Yeah. There was a. Um a sentence I loved very much. Yes. I was touched. It's just the next paragraph, like, so about the spiritual life. So it is with the spiritual life, it unfolds, never leaves. It flows like a stream, never bounds like an antelope. It, it progress, in, um, its progress is a steady, silent advance, only evidenced to us as stages are reached. Yes. Yeah, it's very beautiful, isn't it? This, and it really summarises everything that we've been talking about. I guess I wanted to ask you guys, so if we know this, if we know this, that our spiritual growth is really, as far as we know, it's actually eternal. <laughs> so this idea that we want instant enlightenment, if we contrast that with the truth that we're actually engaged in a lifelong and eternally long um, process of growth, what are the things we're going to have to give up and what are the qualities we're going to need to have in order to make that happen? Pierre, if you pass back to Geraldine at the back. I'm just sitting here the last five minutes or more I'm thinking about my achievement addiction. Yes. Um, Alex brought it up before, but for me, I would say addiction. And yes. Um, yeah, that's really huge, and there's a lot of uh, self-reliance attitude in yep. there. Yep. So sometimes I do. I think about that, and I think, well, seriously, this is 
this is a very, very long, long, long term <laughs> process and um, it could get extremely frustrating if I continue in my um, whole sort of addiction to achievement yes. and feeling that I'm not worthwhile or I'm not worthy unless I'm achieving something. Yes, beautiful. Um, so yeah. what's the truth we're going to have to come to accept? That, that I'm, I'm lovable without achieving. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I am worthy. Without achievement. Or I should say, my worthiness is not dependent upon my achievement. Does that make sense to everyone? Dependent on what I achieve. I'm already loved. So I don't have to strive to earn love. Yes. Okay, what other things might we have to give up or embrace? Glenda, I am. I feel that there's a need to embrace desire. An analogy for me is sometimes in my work I've looked, oh, I'd love to be able to do that or I'd love that job. Mm -hmm. But I have no desire to go through the study required to get there. Okay, so what, what, there's a couple of qualities you're talking about there. What is it then, you're talking about desire, what is it that prevents you being willing to go through the things in order to go for the other job, for example? It's partly lack of desire. Um, partly I don't want to do the hard work. Um, sometimes maybe I'm just looking at the glamorous job and don't really want it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what are qualities you're going to need on this eternal growth, given that? What is it that puts you off about applying for the other job? You look at the job and you think, yeah, I'd like it if I could get up tomorrow and go I, to that job. I don't but, have the knowledge. Yes, yeah, so, so what am I going to need on my spiritual quest? The desire to... Um... Somebody helping her, <laughs> whispering. Patience. No, no, he's all right. Oh, yeah. Patience, yeah. Okay, patience. <laughs> everyone, I can hear everyone uh, over there. Okay, and what, what did you say, Glenda? I wasn't, I wasn't dismissing what you were saying. What did you say to me? It's a desire to accumulate that knowledge. It's what I really need. So desire for knowledge. And what does that mean I'm going to have to confront My addiction to um, being lazy. <laughs> yeah. It's going to take effort, isn't it? Yeah. Don't really want to do the hard work. Yep. Maybe I'm not good enough. Aha, uh -huh, that's another thing. What's that? That's a fear. Self-worth. Yeah. Fear of failure, isn't it? Yeah. So what might I have to be willing to embrace? Fear. Yes, Fear. And will I get it perfect the first time? Maybe. <laughs> then I'd be enlightened tomorrow. We've just said that's impossible. <laughs> if you pass back to Tara, she had her hand up. Yeah. Hi, Mary. Hi, Tara. Um, courage. Ne re nearly really need to um, pray for courage. Courage for what? Courage? Well, for me, courage to trust um, and to deal with my fears. Can I say courage to risk? Yes. And that can be risk a lot of things, can't it? Risk not knowing. Risk looking foolish. Risk not being liked. Not being liked. <laughs> risk giving my heart to something and it not working out. It's going to require risk, what, what we perceive as risk. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, what else do we need on this eternal spiritual quest? Yep, Renee? Um, I feel you have to give up your intellect. Uh, I don't agree. Why do you say that? It's like letting it all go. You, you've really you've got to use the mic on. Yep. Okay. Um, yep, I think you need to pass the mic on because you don't want to deal with the mic emotion. Yeah. If you pass back behind you. So you need uh, humility in order to find the courage to risk? Yes. So will we just say humility? Yep. OK. 
okay? Lots of these things are aspects of humility, I agree. But it's good to get specific, yeah. What else might I need? Uh, yep. Ooh. If we go to Jennifer over here, but in the meantime, pass forward to Raj. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I feel that it's, it's about taking action. It's, it's, it's like doing it. Uh, I'm confronted d daily with, with jobs that need to be done. I have to read the instructions of, and I'm unfamiliar with what I'm doing. Yes. And I just can't grasp what they're trying to tell me to do because they didn't word it correctly and I'm thinking I'm going to screw this up and at the end they'll just say I'll oh, stuff it and do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it works perfectly. But it takes every one of those things. It does take a lot of those things and acting is a big part of it. Yeah. That's a part of... That's a part of confronting what we feel is risk, isn't it? Just acting and, yeah, yeah. But also you're having to confront a lot of feelings when you're reading those manuals as well, aren't you? Like, I don't understand, I feel yeah. stupid, what yeah, is this? I'm like, not worthy. I all those things, yeah, 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 yeah. beautiful. Okay, what else, Lorleen? Oh, yep, as you pass, Jennifer, if you go. I try to ping pong between the two. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is um, steadfastness. Yes. Just sticking with it. Yes. So, um, can we call it perseverance? Sure. <laughs> Just because it'll fit on next to patients? <laughs> yeah. But I agree, steadfastness is a good adjective. Lolene? Um, face the fear of making a mistake? Yes. Yes. So we're going to have to stumble along the way probably, aren't we? Because we're coming from a condition of error and heading for a perfection. And there's, how, do we, how do we learn to walk? <laughs> there's a lot of falling over usually, isn't there? And, and so I think the learning to walk is a great analogy like, for spiritual growth, you know? There's a lot of guts required to get up off the ground and totally ambulate in a way that you've never done it before. And there's a lot of perceived risk involved. There's sometimes where you feel pain. Um, and, but it's really accepted on the planet that that's how you learn to walk, isn't it? And it's like when we come to spiritual growth, everyone throws that out. That's the usual way you learn is that you're not perfect and it's going to take time and you're going to have to keep at it and you're going to have to have patience and perseverance. And when it comes to spiritual growth, we go, yeah, no, it should happen pretty easy. Go this weekend workshop, I'll be right. <laughs> and I feel that a lot of reason we don't, we often resist learning as adults is because our comfort zone has shrunk. We don't like having to persevere in order to, to know something. A lot of times we don't like the feeling, we're so used to being able to control everything by the time we get to adulthood, that we don't like the uncertainty of not knowing. We don't like the feeling that other people are going to see us not knowing. We don't like just feeling awkward. I, I had this big realisation just on that very point with rolling the leads here. There's a really specific way that we roll all the leads so that they kept, they're preserved. They're not, they don't get ruined as easily and they pack well and all of this. And I, I knew that it was an issue of love that I needed to become involved with the setting up and the packing up and everything. And um, I have a, a lot of emotions from my childhood about being dexterous or not being dexterous. And so I was, I re, I was doing these leads, doing these leads week after week. Igor can attest to the fact that I'd be like, man, I just can't get it. And he'd show me again. And, and Jesus would show me again. And I'd be like, oh. And, and then like a couple of weeks ago, I was like, hey, I can roll the leads. This is awesome. <laughs> And I realised how few skills I've gained as an adult, really. I've, intellectually, I've gained a lot of, I've studied a lot, but that's a skill I already thought I had. But to actually learn something new as an adult, it's rarer than you think. Unless it's already in something that you feel, com in an endeavour you feel comfortable with, it's very unusual to break the mould and go and learn something where you feel awkward, you feel stupid, you feel like it, you, you're just making things worse, all these things. And yet, by being humble to just those emotions, I can now roll the leads. And, I'm <laughs> and I know that sounds like a silly little example, but it taught me so much. Um, and also about what how much my level of comfort or my level of um, 
humility towards being uncomfortable physically and dexterously, dexter- in being, I don't know. Um, I'm obviously not embarrassed about being uncomfortable linguistically because <laughs> I can stuff that up. But that whole experience showed me a lot about myself anyway. Yeah. Okay, if we, oh, uh, yep, Lolly. It, it took me back to the first paragraph about um, Afra's discovery as, uh, as a child. And isn't that all of those things what we're talking about? Yes. That they're fearless in how they approach their discovery. They're not worried about making mistakes or not winning or un- getting or they just go ahead with it all. Yeah, and... It's interesting that you say they're fearless because remember a while ago we talked about Fred and someone described him as fearless and I said, is he really fearless? Or is he just willing to face fear? Because as kids, are we really fearless or are we just more willing to face fear? Yeah. So I feel that um, this childlike quality is a big part of it, isn't it? And that is what we're shown in the chapter. Yeah. Yeah. If you keep passing to your right, you'll hit people with their hands up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, along the same lines, Mary, I feel that, um, that I want to enjoy the process. In other words, I want to enjoy learning because uh, it, eternity's a long time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if we're going to fight it the one. whole way and complain about it and tantrum about it, it's going to... We're not going to be very pleasant to be around, for one. We'll lose our friends pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Joy. Uh, Yvonne. Ah. Okay, Mary Magdalene. (laughs) Um, I just got a lot out of watching Mishka, my granddaughter. Like, she's been walking now for maybe eight months. Yep. But she still falls over all the time. And what I love about it is she falls over and it's just not even... Acknowledge. She just gets up again. It's yeah. not a big deal, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's the childlike quality is so important. Like after eight months, she's been solid on her feet, and she still falls over multiple times a day. And it's part of her day. She doesn't think about it, you know. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And that's something that um, remember I said a couple of weeks ago about how. That one of the biggest things that blocks us is our self-punishment, you know, how hard we are on ourselves. She falls over, gets up, learns from that, keeps walking. We fall over, berate ourselves, lay there, go, oh, I can't do it, God, it's too hard, you know. Oh, then we'll get up a month or so later and go, okay, I'll keep going, you know. <laughs> it's a lot of wasted emotion, yeah, yeah. But I agree, yeah, this... We're going to have to be gentle with ourselves, loving with ourselves, and love striving, not the destination, love the journey. Yeah. All right, let's move on now to the next major lesson of this chapter, which is, what is the next major lesson of this chapter? Does Fred learn about? Yep, Nina, yep. Um, the difficulties that he is going to be confronted with in his desire to bring the truth back to earth. Yes, yeah. yes. So what are some of those difficulties? Can someone else tell me that? Yep, Deidre? Um, wanting proof about the identity of the person because I had to ask myself, well, how do I treat you and Jesus? Do I want proof about who you are and, you know, and all that kind of stuff? That's the first one. So I had to be pretty honest about that. And do I believe you're Jesus and Mary? I had to go, not 100%. Yep, yep. And what does... And yet you're here. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. We're right here, <laughs> not just the spirit, yeah. And what does, what does Krishna point out to Fred? Why does that lack of trust, why is that a problem when you're trying to impart truth? If you pass back to Gary, maybe, yeah. Oh, I guess it's, it's a believability thing. Like, um, he, you know, he's a bit like me when I'm first on the path, you know, and I hammered my family and, you know, pissed them off and now they don't talk to me. And, you know, it's sort of like he, he's got this huge, overwhelming desire to impart this knowledge, but Kushner knows the resistance that he's going to face from the people 
on earth. They say, we'll do a miracle. And they say, we'll do another one. And, <laughs> and hey, do another one. My friend just came in. You better do it again. Exactly. You know, so. Yeah. And what happens then to the message that he wants to get across? Yeah, it becomes more, it just gets lost in, I suppose, like when Jesus, he spends half his time, like, with the interviews doing the credibility but no one gets to what he really here to say you know so yeah. that that could be frustrating you can see this desire um could be dampened down when he hits the reality of the resistance on earth which um yeah you know. yeah absolutely any other thoughts on that before i say something yep pierre and then we we hold on so much to our belief system and our beliefs and and when there are challenges, it's just like a whole world will collapse and it will be just uncomfortable. And yeah, that's a big resistance to, yes. to truth. Yep, absolutely. Because what does, that's the other thing that Krishna points out, isn't it? If you, um, you come, you'll have to prove yourself a hundred times and then you'll start talking to them about what you're actually, what you're there to say. And they'll go, oh, you don't know anything. I know more about that than you. <laughs> Which is the arrogance, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Anyone else to add to that? If you pass back to Sarah. Yeah. Uh, I found it interesting that then he talks about how people don't really want to know about the spirit world until they actually pass into it. Yes. And I was thinking about that and I was like, is that because, because of the sleep state and the knowledge that they have that they're maybe aware on some level that it's not going to be, you don't think that's it at all? Not <laughs> at all. Just lack of humility. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, let's let's talk about that last. Let's talk more about this this idea about about Krishna's warning Fred, look, when you go to earth, you're going to try and give people messages. They're going to make you want to prove yourself and prove yourself and then to their friends. Then you try to tell them what you're actually the revelation you're there to impart, and then they'll dismiss you because they they think they already know everything about that subject, even before you finish even saying what, you, what you're going to say. So let's talk about how this applies to us. Who did that? Who in their journal talked about how this applied to us? Yes, Sarah? It was an eye-opener as a medium <laughs> to uh -huh. see the other side of what they go through to try and tell us truth and my guides particularly and how unhumble I am and how I push them away at times and yeah um, and just to see it oh, just to see it from their point of view like they're really trying to love us and impart this knowledge and there's just so much resistance within us and, yes um, and even in my small example of speaking with Robert James Lees last night he was trying to impress upon me that I had the wrong date so I kind of guessed the date. Then he came back to me and told me the right date and I dismissed that because I thought, oh, it's all too uncertain now. And I can't. The fact that he, I wasn't humble enough just to sit with the uncertainty for a while to actually get the clear message about the specific thing. Yeah, I think it's very humbling as a medium to, to think about what we project out there as what must happen. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Reflections on this, how it applies? Lena? Uh, something caught my eye about the actual message that he wanted to um, he wanted to pass on mm -hmm. about their lives we live and how uh, lack of responsibility and the fact that you know most people do not wish to receive that so they won't be interested in hearing the message. Yep. But the words he used, I was a bit confused. The um, he says the. Um, that nothing but um, the lives, the noble self-sacrificing lives. Yes. Why is he choosing these words, this specifically, these words? Oh, good question. I'll tell you. I'll just read the whole sentence to give the context. So F Fred is in this passionate desire to go back and tell them the truth that I want them to know, to realise that nothing but lives, noble self-sacrificing lives and deeds can enter here to help in the determination of their future. So knowing what we know about sacrifice, what do you think it means when he says self-sacrificing? Given that we know that Fred's not at one with God yet and he's come from a Christian background, as does Robert, come from a Christian background. So what might be the other meaning? If we pass back to Alex. Oh, 
I feel like he's really talking about service. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I feel he's saying that noble lives dedicated to service, that is, that, and which is an extension of love, isn't it? When we're in a loving state, we naturally serve. So that's what he's, he wants to tell everyone. Good question, Lena. Okay, back to this, uh, this arrogance that we all have and the rigid, rigidity of our beliefs on earth and how this impacts upon our lives. Who thought about this? What did you come up with? Yep, we go to Nora behind you. Um, just um, in not even spiritually speaking, mm -hmm. people who have an addiction, say alcohol or smoking or whatever, and they can see how bad it's affecting them health health wise and they can't the, the resistance is so big as to well obviously the spirit's influencing them and you can't separate the two but there's the denial that what they're doing is so bad it doesn't matter how much good counsel or advice um, you you give them and they still will reject and resist anything that could be beneficial for them. Very often that is the case, not always. So yeah. that also, it's an analogy to anything um, spiritually as well. Yeah. Absolutely. This, this phenomenon doesn't just relate to spiritual truth, does it? <clears throat> no. But I did ask you how it applies to you, not the world. If you pass back to Tara, get a hand up. Thanks. I was just thinking, um, just even on a daily basis, um, even talking to someone about something I think I know about. Um, I know, for example, sprouting. And if someone's trying to tell me something, I can easily just dismiss what they're saying because I feel like oh, no, I've read books and I've done this and I've experimented. You know, I know what I know. And, um, yeah, and so it's just dismissing the person straight away and um, it just tune out yeah. totally yes. or start talking over them. Yeah. You know, it's happened to me as well, with, you know, the vice versa, but... Um, yes. Yeah. And I think that Deirdre's example of... If we use the example of um, how everyone approaches Jesus, so there's this, this feeling that he must prove himself and really is still, a lot of you have known him four years, observed him really under a microscope, and he still must prove himself. Mm. There's no trust. There's no trust. And even when there's a long period of um, just observing behaviour, whether you have an understanding of identity but behaviour, no trust is allowed to grow. So this shows us that we're living in a huge state of what? Denial? What else would it be? What else? Tara? We're just not trust. We're what causes us not to trust? The yeah. child's trusting, isn't it, Angela? Fear. Yeah, yeah. So we're in a lot of fear, and then um, I observe often, you know, when he's giving a seminar, a lot of people feel like they already know what's what's going on. And, they, and he uses simple, plain language, and so it's like, pff, come on, there, there's none of this addiction to the mystery being met or the, you know, the intricacy that we all need to feel like we really get something very deep. It's very plain. It's, very, it's presented in a, in a very down-to-earth way. So a lot of people have like a, a condescension towards that, don't they? And this is also what Kushner is pointing out to Fred about this interaction that he's going to face, the condescension of people. Barbara? Just behind you, Kel. Yeah. Um, my problem is that I sit there and think it applies to everybody else, so I have huge arrogance. Couldn't possibly apply to me, but yeah. wow, look at all those poor people that it does I apply can, to. I can see that it applies to them. My goodness, they're not even listening. Come on. <laughs> yes, yeah. So there's a lot of arrogance in feeling that... I know what he's saying, I know, hear what he's saying, so I've got it figured out, yeah. So there's another, there's the fear, there's the arrogance, this self-importance, yeah. Um, who else had their hand up here? Yeah. Alex and Rochelle? If we go Rochelle first, then Alex, yeah. Um, 
on the self-reflection, when truth has been spoken to me and I've ignored it, I've then ended up damaging somebody else because of that. Yeah. And so that's probably the biggest thing. Is recognising how when you, you live in this arrogance, how much mm. damage you can do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true, very true. All right, Alex? Um, it's the I know uh, emotion yeah. within me. Um, I started just um, at three o'clock, I came in and just listening to people and listening to you and um, <sighs> this arrogance just came over me and um, had the spirit with me, he's just building me up, giving me these feel-good emotions, I'm going, yeah, I know all this, I know all this, I'm better than them, I know. And uh, this, is, this is like my biggest... This is my biggest hurdle on this path. Yeah. Can, yeah. Could I say, Alex, it's not your biggest hurdle on this path, it's your biggest hurdle... Full stop. Yeah. yeah. And it's great that you're recognising it. But I would, I would not berate yourself for having that feeling. I would just recognise, just like we've been talking about today, you know, okay, if I really was coming from a loving place, I wouldn't even be having this feeling, even if I knew everything. Yeah. So there's lessons of love that I've, that I've yeah. avoided here. And there's obviously these feelings that we're talking about, this fear, this lack of trust inside of me about something very huge. Yeah. Now, I kind of... The, the reason I wanted to say it is I, I feel like exposing myself then allows me to feel that emotion. Yeah, I wanted to address that with you, though, because that's the second time you've done that today. And okay. I, it's not, it's not actually loving to just make a confession in order to expose yourself. Because okay. you're not actually desiring to give a gift to anyone around you or to share anything. You're using a group situation in order to... What you feel is grow spiritually. But you can't actually grow spiritually when you're taking an action that's out of harmony with love. Yeah. Do you see yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Oh, yeah. So yeah. the motivation for doing it is... Um, not to, say, give the gift of a learning that you've had or an experience that you've had. It is specifically, and you've mentioned it twice, just to expose yourself and try to trigger an emotion that you're already, that you're already resisting. Okay. So you're also working against the law of attraction and what the law of attraction might be bringing you in order to expose this emotion. You're saying, I won't trust the way God's bringing it to me. I will generate a way to expose this emotion because then I get to be more in control, I get to do it at my time, I, I can bully myself as well and none of those things are actually working with God in this process. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not yeah. really. Oh, I'm, I'm struggling with the law of attraction around, around what you're saying. Why is that? Um, well, because all I feel is that I know, I know, I know, I know. And I'm better than that person. I'm better than that person. I'm better. Than that. That's all I ever feel. And this this spirit with me that's building me up, building me up, building me up. Yeah, yeah, you're doing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. better than him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's you projecting him quite well. Um, he and you don't desire to really confront your addiction. And while you do that. You, anything you do to try and manufacture a break in that addiction without actually having the desire is not going to work. Do you see? No, I don't. Yeah. But I, I, I can hear you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. While, while you want um, to... What you're doing is you're recognising there's an injury in love yeah. intellectually, but there's not a desire in your heart to change it. And this is a big lesson for, like, a lot of us. We know things and we know them in our head and then we go, oh, I can see I'm not being very loving. I should really deal with that emotion. I know I'll generate something in order to deal with it. But you're not seeing that if you really had the desire, God would bring you situations where you would naturally confront it and you wouldn't be able to control how... It at the moment, you're wanting to control how it happens, you know? Mm. And you're actually, your soul is saying, I want to be in this arrogant position and I'm attracting this spirit to assist me in that. But then 
there's this other part of you saying, telling yourself the story that I'm going to confront that by exposing that in the group, but you're not seeing that you're actually just using the group as a vehicle for your own arrogance. So I'm just not humble to the emotion. I would start with the fact that you don't actually desire to break this addiction. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks. No worries. Let's move on. What were we up to? Deb, you had your hand up. Uh, look, I didn't do um, self-reflection on, on that part, but, but what did jump out at me is, was the, um, the words, um, the greatest care is needed not to drive them away before we have attempted to sow some grain of truth. And I just thought that's got Jesus' name written all over it there, you know, just how gentle he's been with us. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And um, that's what we were talking about, weren't we? The, the, the comparison, if we use the example of Jesus and how he interacts in our life and how our response to us and how that we can actually see that response in a lot of other areas in our life if if we put a microscope onto our life. This is a pronounced example, but I'm saying to all of you, if you respond in this way to him, you're responding in this way to many things. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, who had the hand up first? I think it was Ange at the back, no? Geraldine at the back. Where was this, this that you just read, Deb? No, oh, sorry, I just... Ah, yes. In fact, this is the normal condition in which they desire to circumscribe our work and the greatest care is needed not to drive them away before we have attempted to sow some grain of truth. Yeah. Yes. So it's a patient work. <laughs> Geraldine? Um, there's um, uh, an area of... Uh, sorry talking about um, <laughs> um i'm just it keeps coming and going in my mind um yep. uh it's about um oh, sorry what are we talking about um we talk i was talking about the issue of the issue of the arrogance kushner is explaining to fred the arrogance that people on earth have and we were drawing the analogy between how we regard jesus and his work here and the lack of trust and the feeling that we already know when I don't know how many times I've seen him begin to answer a question to someone and they're like, yeah, yeah, I already know. You can feel that, that I already know what he's going to say before he even gets to say. And many people interrupt him not recognising that he's trying to explain a truth that they don't understand yet. Yeah. So um, one area that I have learnt where I am so quite closed and really struggling to be open to hear the truth is um, in my addiction to self-punishment. Yes. Um, and uh, in some sessions that I had with Natalie, um, she said to me, um, because I was talking about my prayer, how I, she said, her guide said that I need to pray for God's truth and I said I do I pray all the time for God's truth on this you know mm -hmm. and um her guide said yes but you're you're not really you're not really yep. open to yep. God to hearing God's truth on this because basically I'm afraid that if I allow God's truth I'll find that it's the same as my own truth yeah, that's that the fear, yes. I have that fear, and so I'm aware that I need a lot of humility to feel um, a lot of grief. That's, that's what I notice that I'm not wanting to feel, is the grief of how badly punished I have been and how, how deeply I punish myself. Yeah, I would be looking at not the grief but the fear. There's an investment that you have in holding on to self-punishment. So if I look at, say this is me, and there's God up there. Now, very often this me has a feeling that self-punishment is the way that I will avoid the punishment of others. And there's a fear in me 
that if I stop self-punishing, other people will start punishing me. There's also another fear that you talked about, and that is that I feel that if I open to God's truth about me, I'm going to find that, say, I am bad. I am unworthy. So that's my fear. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Then out here, if we just imagine, we have a sort of an imaginary me, which is not really, it's a potential me. This is the me that is God's potential for who I could be. And this is, this is a pretty amazing me. This is the potential in, in this person that God has put in me to become this amazing character. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so this is a me that's not there yet, but it's a potential inside of me. Now to get from this me to this potential me, what's gonna have to happen? Feel the fear. Feel that fear, but what else? What else am I gonna feel in, in the middle? Once I get over that fear, there'll be, what else will be in there? Grief. Grief. Yep, Barbara, if you can have the mic at the front, Miss Barb. In that process, um, you'll be coming to the truth about yourself. Yes, you'll be coming to more and more truth about yourself and you'll be having to give up this... False belief. False belief, yep. And is it going to be an easy ride, do you think? Depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> is it going to be all sunshine and rainbows? After a while, maybe. But initially, what's it going to be? What's, what do you, come on, you guys feel this. Like, <laughs> what, what's it going to be? Uh, yeah. Feel. Yeah, go. Um, allowing myself to feel um, the, the punishment sort of feelings, that all the spirits attacking me all the time. And yeah, that's the start, isn't it? But then if you're getting to the God's potential for you, it's not just going to be one emotion that you deal with, is it? If you're getting to God's full potential for you, which is actually, it, if we say it one minute, that's not even the full potential. Like beyond, but let's just say it one minute at this point. What am I going to have to deal with? If you just pass next to you to Tara. Accepting the feeling of joy and bliss. Yeah. Like, yeah. And okay also like a whole bunch of pain and grief oh, yeah. and loneliness and sadness and terror and like not just about spirits or how, I, you know, if I'm worthy, but like I wasn't loved and then this hard thing happened at high school and then, you know, like I'm going to be feeling a lot of stuff, aren't I? And I'm going to be, as Barbara said, accepting new truths all the time. But the, basically, I'm trying to get you to another fear. At the moment, lots of us hold on to this fear that I'm, and we actually hold on to it as a belief, N not even a fear. We say we're afraid that God will share our belief, actually. So let me change this from fear. The belief is actually, I'm bad and I'm unworthy. Lots of us feel this about ourselves. Can I just ask a question about the pain? Yep. Is that, um, from, from my experience, um, painful emotions is when my heart actually aches, like I can feel my heart aching and hurting. Mm -hmm. Is that what you guys refer to as a painful emotion, when you're feeling like a physical... I'm talking about emotional pain as well as physical pain. So grieving, and it's true yeah. when I feel emotional pain, I often feel it physically as well. But grieving, a heaviness, yeah, uh, shame, and all that, like hopelessness, shame, yeah, painful emotions, if yeah. I could call it that. Yeah. yeah. So, but what I'm getting at is that oftentimes I'm holding on to this belief that I'm bad and unworthy. Because my investment is, if I let go of that belief and accept God's truth about me, which is actually that I'm very worthy, then I have to face a whole other journey. 
which involves pain and going towards what God, the potential that God's put inside of me, which can be really scary and really painful. And so often we keep ourselves invested in a belief. We, we stay in self-punishment, invested in this belief that I'm bad and unworthy. We don't want to give it up. We do not want to give it up because to give it up means challenging a whole heap of pain that's happened, actually happened in my life, that's, that's led me to feel it's better if I think I'm bad and unworthy rather than feel that other people feel I'm bad and unworthy. And it also, it also means embracing the potential, recognising I have a potential that's beyond what, it, what bad and, this bad and unworthy false belief I have and embarking on a journey of uncertainty, of risk, of maybe not getting it perfect the first time, maybe looking like, maybe feeling embarrassed, maybe all of these things. So can you see how we often hold on to certain things because there's big fears around it? Yep. And um, I guess I have a question about... um because I've heard AJ say various things about, um, you know, uh, having that, like, that the truth needs to come into it, God's truth needs to come into it. So I'm wondering, like, how long is it useful to hang around in all those feelings um, without having God's truth? Yeah. It, it's not. <laughs> when you process causal emotion, two things happen. You are humble to the pain that's inside of you, but you are also open to God's truth. That's the only way causal emotion can leave you. You must be open to the truth. And what I'm saying to you actually, Geraldine, which applies for many people actually, is that you're actually angry about pain. And this is the thing that you're avoiding in this holding on to this belief and closing yourself off to God's truth about it. Because when you open to God's truth about it, you're going to feel, ah, I'm worthy, I'm actually lovable, but other people didn't love me and that hurts like hell. I'm angry about that pain, so I'm going to hold on to this belief. Do you get that, guys? Yeah. Do you get that, Geraldine? Yeah, I am angry about pain, how yes. much pain I have to go through. Yes. But I, I do, I work with that a lot, um, the self-punishment and God's truth, and I find that there's lots of, little, lots of times when I can feel that my belief is challenged. Mm-hmm. And I guess I'm saying to you, you're never going to get fully beyond this addiction to self-punishment until you get over your anger about pain. And this, this also speaks to what we were talking to Deb about last week. She's angry about pain and she wants to be angry at God about it rather than accept that God is loving, God created me to heal. And until, until we get over that anger with pain, we're never going to submit to pain. Yeah, I wasn't here last week, unfortunately, so I didn't hear there, There's a sound recording on the net if you'd like to. I, I was just talking to Deb about being addicted to being angry with God rather than feeling the real source of her anger and the real source of her pain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, Mary. Just pass to Ange. Yep. Just back on that, I also find that if you keep that belief of I'm bad and unworthy, yep. then it gives you an excuse to sort of stay stuck. Yes. Um, and then you've got an excuse for why you can't achieve and be the awesome creation that God created you to be totally. and, and then as well for me if, from my family I've got like the tall poppy syndrome I'm not supposed to outshine anyone totally so what I just realized is that um, when I get to that point yeah. I won't actually have the emotion in me that I have in me now the fear of the tall poppy exactly syndrome so it won't be like I'm imagining anyway no <laughs> 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 but you're exactly right. We hold on to the belief as an excuse not to have to deal with the pain. Yeah. And there's a fear of, for me, there's a fear of the greatness as well. Yeah, and not to, to be. I, should, I shouldn't just put pain. I should put fear and terror here as well. Mm. We avoid so much fear and terror 
by holding on to this belief. Because if you think about it, if our environment generally has been sending us messages that we're not very worthy people, and sadly for just about everyone on the planet, we've been sent that message, then when we let go of that belief, allow, allow God's truth to enter us, we immediately feel like, because of the injuries from our childhood, we immediately feel like we're going to be set up in opposition with everyone else on the planet. That's scary. That's a big investment in holding on to that belief. And there's a feeling of, oh, oh my God, I'm going to actually have to be somebody now yes. and do something yes. <laughs> instead of just hiding in the I've background. got to find this unique personality that God gave me. <laughs> yeah. And for most of us, that unique personality was told in various ways in our childhood that it wasn't lovable, that it needed to be modified. So all of those things, we're going to have to confront that. At the moment, we've taken it on and go, they were right, we're not worthy. But if we go, actually, God told me I am worthy, that hurts that you didn't see that in me. Yeah. Okay. Any more on that if we go to Lauleen? Yep. Um, Mary, I have a question about um, if you could please define the difference more clearly about um, self-punishment and repentance. Like it, it always night and day. Yeah, it's not clear to me. I struggle still with this. Um, yes. Yeah. Difference. Yeah. AJ, um, Jesus, <laughs> I've got to work with that emotion. Um, did an awesome talk while we're in Brazil about repentance and forgiveness. And so I feel that um, that'll be up on YouTube probably in the next week. But it's, not a, it's, it's a very simple difference, but I understand that many people have pitfalls with it. When I'm self-punishing, I'm actually avoiding my, my real emotions in favour of just beating myself up. When I'm repentant, I'm willing to acknowledge what the pain that I caused in the other person. I actually desire to know it. I desire to feel it. I desire God's truth on this topic. Remember when we're in self-punishment, just as I was talking to Geraldine about, we're setting ourselves up in opposition with God's truth. We're saying, that's it, I'm a terrible person forever and ever, amen, and I need to be punished in order to change, and all of these things which God never says to us. God's never punishing us. God's not up there saying, if you take 10 lashings, then you'll be all right. God's saying, actually, the way to change is, is to find the truth about yourself. Be humble to the truth about yourself. And if you, are, if you do those things, that's when repentance starts, usually. Because you, you face the truth of what you have done to other people and you're willing to, to allow that emotional experience. And within that also is a desire to, to heal that and to remedy that with that person. That comes naturally as, as you have this desire to grow in love. So that's a very brief summary, <laughs> which is not comprehensive. But does that show you just the stark contrast? Yeah. I feel most people have been trained to self-punish in order to show that they're sorry. And that's a big injury on the planet. Yeah. When we finish repentance, we could never do that same thing again. When we self-punish, we are, we are actually doing it so that we can do the same thing again. We're trying to berate ourselves enough that we feel okay about it, but we get to hold on to the reason why we did it and continue on in life, which means we're going to do it again. Yeah. Okay, Deb. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, there's just been a couple of times when I've been, when I have felt truly remorseful, and I've actually prayed to God, begged God to take the pain from my sister, usually, and yeah. to let me have it. I just wonder if that's a legitimate prayer, if that's possible. It's actually not possible, sadly. You can't, once that pain is in that person, the only person who can get it out is themselves. And this is why we're engaged in this process for ourselves. We have to take responsibility for the pain that's inside of us now, even though other people, when we were small, might not have loved us and that's why how it got in us. We're going to have to take responsibility for the fact that it's in there now and to get it out. When you, when you are engaged in repentance, it's, yes, you can desire that it be taken from that person. Like, 
and to feel it yourself. That is a, a part of that, that feeling, but it can't actually happen. But your willingness to feel through it in a sincere way can often, like, and your desire, that's a loving desire you're having towards God that that person might be helped. And so that does, that does have an impact, but you can't actually take it out of a person. And, yeah. Um, okay. Can you see that this last, this last um, sentence in the chapter, the great majority of mankind at present prefer to postpone any definite knowledge of this life until they arrive here. Can you see possibly why? Because it means facing things like this. It me- it, our condition is largely governed by the harm we've done to others and to ourselves. And so, the, the, again, there's an investment in, in not wanting to know it until we pass because we're going to have to experience pain if we're going to change it. It's not worth postponing, really, though. If you just pass forward to, uh, beside you to Kate, actually, had a hand up. And then, who had their hand up on this side, Renee? Yep. Yeah. Just. Um, just on the same topic on the board, I was um, just with. I, I kind of understand that with moving from from the injured self to the potential, mm-hmm. we have to feel the pain of why we have the belief in us, and then there's also the openness to God's truth. Yep. So. When I, well, one thing that I've been doing is just trying to connect to God's truth as well as praying about my resistance to why I hold on to this opposition. Yep. And when I'm, when I'm just praying about God's truth and feeling that, I'm sort of feeling, um, I guess I'm feeling like unworthy type emotions and now I'm just wondering if I'm just feeling my belief system, like a sort of whether I'm, it's just avoiding going to the, the pain, the, the, the fear, the terror. So you're saying that you are longing to God for God's truth? Yeah, so say I, I can understand in my mind God's truth about yep. my beauty Yep. So I may look at things in nature or sometimes I have attractions like I see a bird and yep. I'll just be crying about that because feeling the unworthiness of God's gift and I'm, not, I'm just wondering if I'm just feeling my own belief system, if that's anything's releasing for me in that process. So you're saying you're feeling unworthy but you're longing for God's truth but you don't feel it enter you? I'm not really sure if it's entering me or not. Yeah, I don't really understand your question. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. Yeah, I feel that as you... I I think your question is, are you self-punishing? Is that right? You're going to have to feel your belief system. You're going to have to grieve your belief system. So that's not wasted if that's what you're doing. Is, Is that what you're asking? Um, perhaps, yeah, I'm just getting a bit unclear myself, but okay. like I'll be praying for God to help me with the, the whole thing, if I understand this. Yeah, if I can say, when we're humble, we'll, we will grieve the injured belief system. And it may not be instantaneous that God's truth enters us, but when we're really humble, we are open to that happening. Sometimes we just have to grieve a fair bit to to make enough space for the truth to enter us. If it is sort of like a physical, you could make a physical comparison. You're chock full of error beliefs and you're going to have to be humble to grieving their error enough so that God's love, God's truth can actually enter you on that same subject. I'm a bit unsure about what this is with the truth entering, entering you. Well, for example, with Geraldine, her belief is, I am unworthy and I am bad. Now, God's truth that would enter her would be, I am beautiful and worthy. And that would enter her emotionally. So that's, that's what I mean. And it would be with her then. It wouldn't be just like hearing me say, you're all beautiful and worthy. You know, you could all go, yeah, 
Yep. But it's like what I said before. If all of you went, yes, I get that now, that would be a lie because you have to go through an emotional process of receiving that truth. Does that make sense? And to receive the truth, we would have to have released all the cause or fear and pain about that while we believe that? Yes. Oh, right, yeah. So we have to release the injury and receive the truth. So in that case, should we not sort of pray about the truth until we've... Should we first address the pain before... You, it's impossible for you to receive the truth if you're not humble to the pain. Okay, so there's no point just trying to open to God's love. Uh, this is my confusion, I think. But I'm happy to stop if you ask me to as well, because I yeah. see I'm asking a lot about this. I feel that the issue, Kate, is just you have a fear of your emotions, yes. and that's blocking the whole process for you. Yes. So you're trying to long to God for love and truth without actually having the humility to experience them. Yeah. And that's, that actually means having the humility to experience yourself. So I feel that's where you're getting, getting locked down, you know. And so you, you, can, you can forge a tiny relationship with God, but until you're willing to just be humble to that relationship unfolding in a way that you don't control, you're not gonna, it's not going to grow. Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. We need to wrap up soon. Any last minute? Renee, you had a question or a comment? Mine was just about how angry I am about my pain. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just feel that I have, like, from our son dying and um, how much pain there's still left in me to feel about that and... Um, and that um, when I was when after, when it did happen and I felt so much grief then for such a long time and um, <laughs> when can I just say say, yeah. say something <laughs> Honey, the thing that happens with you is you're not loving with the microphone. Oh, what? No, you're not lo- loving I'm going to be with in love with it, do I? I have to love it. <laughs> yeah. You have to love everyone else enough to let them hear you. Okay. Uh, but also... I'll hold it up higher. Is that better? That's it's much higher. better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I've got it too low. <laughs> but can I say to you on what you're saying, this anger about the pain has actually prevented your, your true grieving process to begin yet. I, this I, is. I feel, I'm feeling that more and more because I've been... Just recently connecting to how much how bad my soul condition is, <laughs> and um, but what I wanted to ask was um, that so like when I started connecting to the grief and I was in public, that everybody like freaked out around me and shut me down or ran away and like so. After so many months, I started to um, close it all down and I, I, I'm so lost. I don't know what's real or anything anymore, so... Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ren, just quickly, because we've got to finish. Sorry, I need to take your time up. Well, you did, but it's okay. Oh, um, <laughs> I would start here for you. You have an addiction... Very strongly, yes. ...to anger. Yep. Oh, okay. And you do two things. When, when you can't control the situation or when you don't feel loved, you do one of two things. You get angry with the person. Like before when I said, you've got to pass the microphone on, you got real angry with me for a couple of minutes because you, you, you didn't want to be humble. Yeah. I didn't actually really realise I wasn't being heard across... The board, like and, I didn't and this is what I talked about last week about having love for other people and being aware of that we're in a group and that, yeah. that we need to be aware of what's happening. But you get angry at other people or you get angry at yourself. Yeah. This is exactly what I was talking to Geraldine about. Is yeah. that, so that's like blaming myself and self-punishment. It's the same yes. as the anger and, and it's all one of 
the same. It's one of the same and it's all used to actually avoid the truth about yourself. And at the moment you've got, just like Geraldine actually, you've got some fears that you, you feel you're actually worse, that you are unlovable. You're afraid of this and this is making you not want to open to God on this matter because God has a different opinion of you. But then there's also things that you feel you're entitled to and that you don't want to let go of. And so those two things keep you wanting to stay in this anger place all the time. And you feel like it's not fair and then you feel like I'm so bad and, and it's none of us getting you anywhere, you know? And just, just tired. <laughs> yeah, you get tired. In my mind, my mind's just active from that. Exactly, exactly. And it... it it becomes very circular and it's good that you're feeling tired because it means you might be beginning to be ready to realise this isn't working for me. You know? I still don't believe it though. Like somewhere I still don't believe that I'm lovable and I don't believe that, um, that but, I'm worthy and, yes. and that I don't, especially with that, in that circumstance, which I feel is holding a key to so much. It is, it is, Renee. You attracted a really strong event, a really intense event that is actually the doorway to a lot of your grief from your childhood. I, I can feel it and I can see it all intellectually. I can see it all, but I can't access it emotionally. Yeah. And uh, look, honestly, just what I just shared with the girls just before about this whole process of wanting to hold on to the self-punishment rather than engage this process with God is exactly where you're at. And you can't feel this truth that you are beautiful and worthy yet because you're not willing to experience the pain that's already just there within you, you know? And I feel that this... this process that happened when, you, when your baby passed and you became overwhelmed with grief in public a few times and people shut you down, this is showing you some of the barriers you have now to just experiencing your grief. The, they were almost demonstrating to you all the false beliefs you have about grief. <gasps> you're not going to be able to cope with it. You're gonna, you're, oh, what's wrong with her? You know, all that kind of stuff is the fear that you have. That was the message you were given and that's what you're going to need to work through in order to... to so it's... Firstly, working through this addiction to anger and secondly, being willing to face the fear you have about your grief. And in the end, it's the, pretty much the same for all of us. And, and I feel I was, yeah, the shutdown was all just part of my, my childhood anyway from being shut down constantly every time I spoke, no matter what, whether it was a yeah. truth, or, you know, being little and speaking something I felt was truth, mum, dad, you're not loving each other, I'd say, and they basically tell me to shut up so yep that's exactly so right just, but right now constant. you're just not receiving what oh, i just gave you. you okay thanks and there's another addiction in that so yeah okay all right i think we're we're over time today guys sorry about that but um thank you very much for your participation today that was Jesus and I are going to Kyabra for the next two weeks. So they won't, we'll do chapter 11 down south and you can see it on YouTube. Um, two pieces of homework. Let me remember them. One is to listen to Robert James Lees. It's up on the website. Uh, if you go to downloads, events, there's a date, today's date, and you'll find the channeling that AJ and I did with Robert James Lees last night. Um, and the other thing was about reflection, and I can't remember it now. Look, I really think the theme for today is to feel about your spiritual progression and the addictions that you have in place to avoid this, this journey across the bottom of the board that I was pointing out to, to you guys about wanting to hold on to a false belief about yourself rather than embarking on this, this journey where we pointed out all the qualities that you're going to need to have. Is that clear? Cool. Thanks, you guys. I had a bit of an off day today, but it was fun. <laughs> Oh, the new date?